Laurel, this is Brother Brent. And uh, we'll uh, have time to say hi uh, after the study. Um, he's part of Brother Ryan's um, Bible study there in Modesto. So he yes. came down. We're blessed to have him. Yeah, Bertie's going to record it. His name there. Church Directory? That. Yes. Um, well, while, they, while they're doing that, just a couple of announcements. Um, tonight we're going to do a study on the details of the rapture. Um, this was a question that came up from a dear brother in the Lord and his, and his fiance, who's uh, new to the grace message. And um, their, with her background, she, she didn't know much, she wasn't taught much about this, this uh, topic of the rapture, which is one of the most essential doctrines in the Apostle Paul's letters. So this is something we're not to be ignorant of. We're going to see that. So we're going to do a study. But before we do, a couple of announcements. Um, well, first of all, tonight is the 20, what's the 23rd already? Wow. It's April 23rd, 2014, Wednesday night. Thank you all for being here. Uh, just a couple of announcements. Always give thanks and praise to the Father for his glorious grace through Jesus Christ our Lord, dying for our sins on the cross there, um, for the word of God, for, for the fellowship of the saints. Uh, what we have in NorCal Grace is special because not a lot of the people who follow us, and we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds all over the world who follow us by way of the Internet, but they don't have the privilege of having, many of them don't have the privilege of having a local assembly, so we thank God for that. Be in prayer for your civil authorities. Uh, that's what uh, the will of God, to show the grace of God, and that we might lead a quiet and peaceful life in all godliness. Be in prayer for Ryan. Uh, he bring us here, Ryan, with some, some brethren there in Modesto. You want to be in prayer for their, their weekly studies as well. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, the YouTube channel, the website, Sister Jan's blog, the, the now we're on uh, cable television, UVerse Channel 99 and Comcast Channel 18. That's Sundays at 5 p.m. here in, the, in our area, Sacramento County area. We have the radio, uh, Understanding the Bible. Both, both the radio and TV are called Understanding the Bible. The radio is every Sunday at 1 p.m. KFIA, which is AM 710 locally, or KFIA.com, you can hear it on the internet at that time. Or Brother Ryan also puts it on our YouTube. Um, he actually takes the audio that I do edit it, cleans it up, and then uh, sends it back. I send it to radio, but he'll post it uh, that week. So we appreciate that. A couple of announcements. Um, hey, come on in. Hey. hey, what's up? How you doing, John? Come on in. Good to see you. All right. Good to see you, man. All right. Jonathan, I don't know. If, I think you met Brother Brent from Augusto here, or he came around. Right right so. Anyway, um, tonight we won't do our... Oh, by the way, we do have uh, church cards as well. Brother Jim had a wonderful idea. He actually has advertised our church on his Jeep out there. He, he, has, the, the, he has our church information on the back. He's like a, a, a riding billboard. <laughs> <That's good. laughs> but for those who uh, don't uh, attach that to their cars, we do have our information on these church cars. You want to let people know about us in the area? You don't have time to really talk to them? Always take a couple of these. You can, uh, we have plenty and whenever we run out. Krista orders more. Um, we're not going to do our regular study in Ephesians tonight. We'll pick that up next week. We're going to do a study on the details of the rapture. I told you how. Some questions that I get, I get questions every day. Some of them I can just answer real quick, 10, 15 minutes in an audio. Others are so important and so good that I need to do an extended study, you know, for an hour study. But we're recorded so that other people can get the answer as well. A lot of people don't know or are confused about the rapture particularly people who come out of denominationalism where they mix some things. We'll see that tonight. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to have our regular study in 1 Corinthians chapter number 2 on Sunday. We did a, a study on the origins of Easter last Sunday, and um, that has been a, a hit. People have been telling me they appreciate us doing that study. Folks, have, some, some people have uh, looked at it multiple times. One lady said she looked at it three times already. So it, it is a, uh, I decided to do that and record it so that, you know, down the line if people want to know, We'll have a video already in our, on our YouTube to uh, answer that question each year. I don't have to go through it every year and just say, check that out. Same with this rapture. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at that tonight. Uh, the Lord's Supper. We plan on doing something this Sunday. Am I right there? Are you? So here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a regular Sunday study. And um, how do we do that? Then we still have our Q&A. Nice. Okay. All right, let's do that. We're going to have our Sunday study. Hopefully the weather is nice. Okay, we have our Sunday study, 
And then we'll, we'll have, so you can bring, it's more of a potluck, so if you like to bring something, you don't have to, but if you like to bring something, bring, bring it to share with the saints. And there's a park about five minutes away, right there on Cypress. We'll, we'll, everybody will we'll give you the information. And there's a park, little park area for the children. And then we can sit at the tables and have our Q&A out there over a meal, okay? That's pretty much how they did it back in the days of the apostle. They would have a study, Q&A, and eat together. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to dedicate that to the Lord. Offering for you guys here, there's the offering box. That's how we uh, uh, provide for the ministry and the minister. Um, I did a study. I did, I'm did. i doing a two-part study on how to give. So this Sunday, I'm going to teach about the tithe, what, exactly what it is, because most people aren't taught. They're taught to tithe by their religious leaders, but don't really are taught what the tithe is. And then the next week, I'm going to actually show how Paul says to give in our dispensational grace. So that'll be a two-part study. Um, people have asked about our Midwest trip. So it is. I, I have to make this announcement. We're still going to make a Midwest trip. I always go back to... Uh, well, for, dec for over a decade now, probably about 14, 15 years, I've, I've, I've been part of a, a conference in, in, in Illinois from my pastor from back in the day, Brother Richard Jordan. Um, even being here almost three years, the last two years in California, all my seven years in Minnesota, and then obviously when I lived in Chicago, part of the Shoreward Ministries, I've been a part of that, either his conference or others as well in the area. I wasn't, I wasn't asked back this year because of a disagreement on, 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 a, on a topic that um, I see from Scripture and these brethren of Grace School of Bible, most of them don't. And sad, so I, I haven't been asked back. I have not heard from Brother Jordan personally yet. That's what saddens my heart the most. I, I wouldn't mind not being invited back, but at least if I was told. I had to find out from other sources that they've already had the speakers and have the schedule. So for the first time in many years, I, weren't, I wasn't asked back. And, and the issue particularly is the issue of joint heir with Christ. And um, some people can see it and grow on with it and appreciate it. Others, some of the old, old time um, grace guys, they just refuse to. <coughs> um, with that said, I, we still want to make our, we still wanted to make our Midwest trip because we do go back to Minnesota, my old church in Twin Cities Grace Fellowship. We also, I still may go back to Chicago. I'm thinking about it because I'll make myself available. A lot of the saints who go to that conference want to see me teach and preach. They, many of them come just for that, so they'll be disappointed. And I'll, I'll do that for them. So what I'll do is, I'll make myself available to any of the saints in Chicago, Atlanta area, who normally go to the conference. Um, even though I'm not speaking there, I'll set time each day that we're there. We're going to be there a few days, maybe three, four days. We'll see. We'll, we'll, we'll look at the calendar and, and how the Lord provides. But I'll make myself available. If you want to talk to me about it, I'll tell you what I believe. If you want to have studies about it, I'll, I'll do Bible studies for anybody who wants it. Any of the preachers and teachers there who are used to seeing me there, they really want to know what I believe and not hear hearsay, I'll be there to I'll be available to talk about it. You can teach me where I'm wrong and I got questions, or I'll teach you what I see and you got questions, but I'll make myself available. So please be in prayer. For those who want to give to that ministry, you can do it online. Just put Midwest Trip. You can send it in the mail. Just put Midwest Trip. And you guys, don't worry about it. We, we'll, just, we'll just have what you give. That goes towards the local ministry. But for those who on the Internet who are getting something out of it, they want to give back, that's one way. You can give regularly, but that Midwest trip is important for us to give back once a year. Okay? I want to, on that, share a, an encouraging email that I got, particularly about that. As you guys know, I always answer uh, people's emails. I get Bible questions every day. This particular email was very encouraging. Let me see if I can find it. Yes, here we go. It's a two, it's a two part. I won't go through the whole thing, but it says, uh, someone asked me about the issue of joint air, and, and, and they asked if there were people in the past who taught it. And obviously there were. I mean, the Apostle Paul, and I, you know. But, but I, 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 I told her about, you know, um, the, the issue is not, validating it by, from what people say. It's, is it in the scripture or not? So I gave her scripture. So here's what she said. Thanks again, Ron. Forgive me in my weakness of looking to past teachers to, valid, to validate a teaching. I fear what seems to be new because it's how I got all messed up in my walk and understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ. I appreciate you sticking to the scriptures in order to persuade me. After watching your video on suffering with him, that's on our YouTube, we did that a few weeks ago, and going over all the verses after the end of your video, 
I, she said, she see it. I came to Second Timothy, and it is here that it was very made very clear to me about this issue. Suffering with him comes from sharing the teaching of the truth, which is the truth that you hold dear because it gives you life. And this truth being rejected is what the afflictions and rejection is all about. So she understands it's the truth and being rejected for the truth. In essence, I stand for truth, and the brethren at the conference now are rejecting me. But I understand the issue. I'm willing to suffer and take that as part of the suffering for the truth. And no, no higher truth in Paul's epistles is this issue of joint error and judgment seat. So she's starting again. She says, the truth being is, is the mystery, the gospel of grace in all its simplicity. This truth being the doctrines revealed through Paul. To the joint heir inquiry, there was no doubt. Now get this. She's new to all of this, and a lot of people who are new to all this, they see it. There was no doubt to me that there was an obvious distinction being made in Romans 8.17 between heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. I'm going to say that again. She says, there was no doubt to me that there was an obvious distinction being made in Romans 8.17 between heirs of God and joint heirs of Christ. She says, and then she goes on to say, so what I did, she, you know, she wanted more in, in, information on it. So Brother Matt Stutzman in Southern Cal, he, I, and Ryan, they, they, they collaborated. You know, guys know about this paper. What I did, I sent Brother Matt's paper to her, and she read it. She says, I got to read it a few times. It's really deep. Yeah. Doctor, it's deep. <laughs> But she's got, but right off the bat, she says, basically she's saying, when I read it, I can see, obviously. And really, it's, the, it's, it's really the, the old guard of the dispensationalists who are fighting and opposing it. A lot of the people who are just reading and coming to know this truth, they see it. So I just wanted to encourage you guys. She says, um, the, the water was, was muddy in, 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 her, in, her, in her understanding of the Bible, but since we, she's been following us, it's gotten, uh, she's gotten, you know, the mud has been clearing up and so forth like that. So I just wanted to share that with you guys that although I've been rejected, oh, let me finish this. She goes, oh, I love this. I hope I don't die soon as I certainly don't want to be stuck at the level I am at. I am studying and learning about God's word in every free moment I can, speaking of through our ministry. Redeeming the time. Redeeming the time. That's exactly right. And she says, I, have, I know I've wasted a lot of years, and it's my fault. I am awfully sorrowful about that. So she, she feels like she let the Lord down. I don't want to be ashamed before the judgment seat of Christ. And she goes on to talk about what her, her job, the heavenly place she wants to bring with him, and so forth. I just want to encourage you guys. That's the, and Crystal will tell you this, that's the response we've been getting with teaching joint heirship in the judgment seat of Christ. It is making saints who are just whole hum about their, their walk, their Christian walk, now they're redeeming the time. They're working out their own salvation with fear and trembling. So I, 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 I'm happy to suffer rejection for this message. Because just for all those people in the old guard who don't like it, there are many people coming to see this truth clearer and clearer. Okay? So we praise the Lord. Be in prayer for me and, uh, and um, those who stand up for this truth. Tonight we're talking about the rapture. That it's, it's soon. Because some of the things that are happening, out in both outside, but more importantly inside the church the body of Christ, especially amongst dispensations, people understand Paul. I think this is the last ditch effort of, of God, these recovered, yeah. resurgent truths, to get saints to redeem the time so they can get it's a gracious thing right. by God. All right, let's get into our study in the book of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Let's start there. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, tonight's study is the details of the rapture. I wanted to talk about this again because there was a, a dear brother in the Lord whose fiance is, is coming to know the, the rightly divided word. He himself is growing in it as well. Very, very passionate about this truth. I probably get a, a question every day or every other day from this brother and, and he's he just growing and want to learn the truth, which I'm excited for. And uh, excuse me, he has a Pentecostal background. His fiance, his future wife has a, he, in fact, he wanted, he says, Ron, I wish you could do our wedding. <laughs> and I go, I wish, you know, yeah. So he was, he was asking me, should I have a, our denominational preacher? I say, whatever you want, you can have a judge or whatever. But he really wishes I could, he lives out in Ohio, wish I could do it. Anyway, they're, they're learning about dispensational truths, and, and she has a Baptist background. But one of the things that he, he mentioned, he says, she didn't know or wasn't taught much about the rapture. 
which is interesting because yes. not every denomination, yeah, it's a Baptist yes. denomination. Yeah. But they, they're all type of different Baptist denominations. So That's true. in her particular one, she grew up in or was associated with that not much was said about it. So he asked in an email, could I kind of uh, you know share, you know, break it down for her? But this was such an important question and such a, 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 a pinnacle doctrine amongst Paul's doctrine, not as pinnacle as joint error, but but up there. I decided just to do a topical message. So, so tonight we're going to look at the details of the rapture, or what is the rapture. We're going to examine the event that ends the present dispensation of grace, because that's what this is. But there's a lot involved in just, in just the catching away of the church. But where we find this issue of the rapture, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and let me read a few verses to you. I'm going to read down to verse 18. Here we go. Uh, start at verse 13, sorry. 1 Thessalonians 4, 13. Paul says, but I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain, unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, come for one another with these words. Now, even as I read that, you guys can see the sense of what the Apostle Paul is, is saying, but we're going to break it down, this passage, another passage from 1 Corinthians 15 and others. But what I want you to see is that this issue of rapture, you know, before I do, look at verse 13. This is interesting. Verse 13, but I would not have you to be what? Yes. Ignorant brethren. And in that issue of ignorant brethren, Paul uses that terminology six times in, in, his, script, in, in his epistles. And, and, and when he says, I would not have you to be ignorant, many times most of the body of Christ are ignorant of these six things. So I'm going to lay them out for you just, just for, for your own uh, edification. Real quick, when Paul says, I would not have you to be ignorant, so don't be, don't ignore these things, okay? Ignorant, don't be ignorant brethren. Now, he says that terminology, ignorant brethren, ignorant brethren, six times. And there's another time where Paul says, he uses that, and then plus one more time, he uses the, the term, not ignorant. Uh, I'll, I'll talk to you about that. But the first thing he says about not being ignorant brethren is found in Romans chapter number 1 and verse 13. And what that is, is his apostleship, his apostleship and his calling. His apostleship and his calling. The apostle Paul was called to be the apostle of us Gentiles. So calling to the Gentiles. The one whom God has ordained to speak to you and me today as Gentiles, as the nations, which includes the, the Jewish people as well, that God not, does not reckon them among the... He, excuse me, in time past, he did not reckon Israel among the nations, in the book of Numbers, but, but today in the dispensation of grace, Israel has fallen to among the nations. Okay? And so every nation, the Gentiles, is under Paul's dominion. The first thing you're not supposed to be ignorant of is the fact uh, that of, of Paul's apostleship and, and calling to the Gentiles. You can read that. The second thing, Romans eleven twenty five, Romans eleven twenty five, Paul says, "I would not that you should be ignorant of this mystery." And what that is is that Israel has fallen. The blinding of the nation of Israel, or the fallen status of Israel today, okay, and salvation coming to us Gentiles. So he's talking about the, the mystery is that the blind is the fault. God is not dealing with the nation of Israel today as a nation. He's doing something else until, by the way, the fullness of the Gentiles. And our, to our topic tonight has to do with that fullness of the Gentiles. When that fullness happens, God's going to end the dispensation with the event we commonly call the rapture. I'll see why, you'll see why he says that. So Romans 11.25, don't be ignorant of that mystery. Okay? That blindness in part, that God has set Israel aside for a season and for a reason. The season is the dispensation of grace, and the reason is their unbelief in their Messiah, Son of God, Jesus Christ. The third time is 1 Corinthians chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 and verse 1. Paul says, 
I'll, I'll, I'll say it like this because we we're not reading it, I can respond. The, the Israel's identification with Moses. So when you think about the nation of Israel, they're identified with Moses. They're baptized unto Moses, the, the term says, baptized unto Moses. And baptized means totally identified with Moses. So Israel's doctrine has to do with the law, okay? And, by the way, in that chapter, and their sanctification, so their sanctification through the law, okay? And another thing, as I read that today again, it's, it's so that we can learn, we can learn, we the body can learn from their mistakes. We can see God's attitude towards sin, although we're not under the law, we're under grace, we can learn from the, from the Old Testament. And by the way, that's the purpose of the Old Testament. We can learn from Israel's mistakes. We can see how God dealt with Israel and appreciate his grace today, right? Mm -hmm. So Israel was baptized unto Moses. They, they were sanctified through Moses' ministry the same way we Gentiles will be sanctified through Paul's ministry. Okay. All right. A couple more. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. This one has to do with Paul himself giving us understanding of the purpose, the purpose, the operation, as well as the temporary nature of the supernatural spiritual gifts. He does that in chapters 12, 13, and 14. We're going to be studying that out as the Lord's tarry because we're, we're in 1 Corinthians on our Sunday study. So don't be ignorant of Paul's your apostle. Don't be ignorant of what God's doing today. He's operating the mystery of Christ. He's not dealing with Israel. Don't be ignorant that Israel's Old Testament has to do with the law of Moses and their sanctification. But we can learn from the Old T. It's written for our learning. We can learn God's attitude towards sin. Appreciate God's grace through, through Christ today. We can learn the purpose and operation of the temporary spiritual uh, nature of the spiritual gifts. The fifth one is uh, 2 Corinthians chapter number 1, verse 8. And that is the sufferings of the faithful grace believers. There is, there is a purpose of sufferings when it comes to faithful grace believers. And there is a reward for it. That your sufferings as a faithful grace believer are not in vain. Paul's going to tell us that. God allows that suffering to come to, to, to use it to bear his glory now, but also to bear his glory in those faithful at the judgment seat of Christ, at the, at, in, the, in the ages to come. That's determined the judgment seat of Christ. So Paul says, I would not have you ignorant of my suffering. Paul was suffering based upon the mystery of Christ. Paul's suffering was based upon the mystery of Christ, his ministry. So will ours. But we're going to get the same blessed hope that he has. We're going to share in that, in that rule and reign as joint heirs with Christ. That's what it means to be a joint heir with Christ. Joint heirs with Christ. It so be that we suffer with him. And the way Jesus Christ suffers today is in the mystery of Christ being rejected. When they said, well, they didn't tell me. I found out for the first time in over a decade, I'm, I'm not part of That's fine because of what I believe. That's right there. See, I, I, I have this in my inner man. It saddens me, it grieves me because they're brethren. I don't, I don't have any hard feelings. I'm just sad that guy didn't tell me before he made his mind. But anyway, the fact is, I understand what's going on. There's some truth. And I, I got an email today I'll share with you guys uh, Sunday from, from a saint who, when they, when they found out, they're, just, uh, they're in outrage that, they, they're, that they're acting that way towards me and us. Those of us who believe this truth. All right. Now, the last time is our text here in 1 Thessalonians 4, okay? So I'll put that there. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4, verses 13 through 18. And what this is, is this one is the, what, what happens with the death of the, of, the, of the member of the body of Christ? The death of the believer today. What's going on? And the resurrection, okay? And I say resurrection because that's what Paul's talking about when we talk about the rapture. So the, the last thing Paul wants us to know, so let's, let's look at this. Don't be ignorant that his apostleship was from God to you and me today. Don't be ignorant of his message called the mystery of Christ, what God's doing today. He's not dealing with the nation of Israel. He's dealing with the body of Christ. Don't be ignorant that when you look at Israel's program, the issue of their sanctification was the law of Moses, 
We can learn from their mistakes. We can learn God's attitude to sin, but that's not us. Our sanctification comes through the Apostle Paul. I definitely believe that when Paul says he went over to Mount Sinai in Arabia in the book of Galatians, there's only one other time, well, well Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is significant to the law of Moses. I actually believe that for 40 days, Paul went right there, and where God gave the law to Moses, he gave the gospel of grace to the Apostle Paul. That's just me. I believe that. All right. So that's what's going on there. First Corinthians 12, he had to teach the saints about the, the, the purpose and, and operation and nature of other gifts. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1, you're going to suffer if you are faithful to the mystery. That's a fact. But it's suffering that leads to glory of the judgment seat of Christ. Okay? And then the, the sixth one is when a, when a believer dies... It's not the same type of death that a lost person and, and, their, and their loved ones have to endure and experience. There's something different going on. We have a different mindset when a believer dies. Okay? And we know we're going to see them again. There's a resurrection where we're going to be reunited. Now the seventh one, I'll just add this seventh one. He doesn't use the term ignorant brother. He says we're not ignorant of his devices. But his devices is talking about Satan. And that's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Did I put my, uh, my thing? Yeah, verse 11. And what that all about, you can read it on your own time. Paul had to kick out a guy in 1 Corinthians 5 for having his father's wife. And that, that leaven of carnalism and lasciviousness was affecting the entire church. He said, put them out. I delivered them unto Satan. Well, they went from one extreme to the other. They allowed him in there, wouldn't do, deal with him. Then they kicked them out, like Paul says, but when it was time to bring them back into the fold, rest, restore him to the saints, because Satan wants you to be on your own. Satan doesn't want you to have other people to be around. And that's what the device was. It was that it was the, the, to, to break fellowship, to break fellowship, to have them in such extremes that, check this out, extremes, whichever extreme. The first extreme, 1 Corinthians 5, was have, him, have that leaven inside there, yeah. Have it there. Let, let it leaven the whole lump. Whether it's religious leaven, the Galatians, or lasciviousness of the Corinthians. Whatever leaven, just let it fester, get everybody. Or if you did put them out, don't let them back in. The, the, the opposite extreme, um, lack of fellowship. Because Satan was having a good time beating up on that brother. And Paul says, that guy repented. Bring him back into the fold. You guys need to heal him and restore him. So the, the, the devices of breaking fellowship, leaven, all those things that were going on, Paul says those are satanic devices to, to bring shame to the body of Christ. Get people out on their own with no, with no fellowship, mess them up. Get people to allow that leaven in their life of religious uh, denominationalism, religious legalism, or carnalism. Okay? So there's are the ones, six ignorant brethren and one ignorant of his devices. Now this one here, look with me at our text again. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. All of these are, are weightier issues in Paul's epistles. There's weightier things. By the way, Dorothy, with that Lord's Supper, the one I did, yes. I went over it, and so it was, it was pretty good. That's a lesser issue amongst the Apostle Paul, because he only mentions it one time. It was really a meal, and just the spirit of it was not done right. He didn't even give the instruction on how to do it. He just said, do it in the right spirit. But, but when it comes to these issues, these are weightier issues. There's weightier and lesser, right? And the most weighty or pinnacle doctrine, I believe, is the issue of joint air. That's why it's being opposed. So. It wasn't an ordinance, was it? What, the, uh, the Lord's Supper. Supper? No, it was a tradition it was that a they did. celebration. Yeah, but that, but that was a normal tradition in the Mediterranean, uh, in the Middle East anyway. It was just that when you come together as saints, it was, it was to honor the Lord. What we do right here is communion. We don't say, well, we're going to go to church and everybody will do. No, we just come, right? It's a fellowship. Well, they would just have that meal, but they were doing it in the wrong spirit. So I, I went through all that on there. Right. So anyway, so th these are the most pinnacle doctrine. A brother said, of all those preachers that they invite to the conference, that week long conference, not all those guys agree on every detail of everything. And he says, that doesn't keep them from being invited. I go, I know. I, I know all these brothers all over the year. They differ on all type of stuff and from Paul's epistles. So the guy says, well, why would they not because of this? I said, because it's the pinnacle doctrine, the issue of being a joint heir and the judgment of Christ. And Satan doesn't want that to be proclaimed. 
It's a doctrine to stand for. It's, it's the highest doctrine, in my opinion. Not my opinion from studying out Paul. But these are important. Let's look at this issue of the death of the grace believer and the resurrection. Look with me, if you will, to 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren. Don't ignore this. Know it. Concerning them which are asleep. Now, I can't even go through all this. Speaking of that conference, I did, a, I did one. Brother Jordan invited me to do the issue of what happens when we die. So you can find that. What happens when we die? So I went through the whole thing. The issue of a sleep has to do not with soul sleep. Okay? I deal with this Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, uh, more, um, the Jehovah's Witnesses believe the same thing. The issue of sleep there is not the soul. When Paul in Philippians says, I'm absent from the body is to be what? Present with the Lord. To be present. That's a, that's, that's a, to be present with the Lord. To depart and to be with Christ. He's going to exist with the Lord. He's going to be with Christ. Revelation talks about all those souls under the altar out there. Saying, how long ago, Lord? Those people were dead on the earth, but they're alive with the Lord. They're with Him. When you die, your soul exists forever. Whether in torment or in bliss with the Lord. What sleeps is your what? Physical body. When we go to 1 Corinthians 15, it's 1 Corinthians 15, it's the physical bodily resurrection. Okay? It is when you look at your body, it looks asleep, doesn't it? You ever see somebody that's asleep? I joke sometimes with my wife, she doesn't like when I do it, but sometimes our daughter, the only peace we have really is when she's asleep. She just got a lot of energy. And she'll just be she'll be so tired, she'll just fall asleep. And I'll joke, I say, don't she look like she's dead, like in a casket? Like, don't say that, don't say that. But she does. She, it's kind of creepy because she's just kind of, and I'm like, that's what she did. She might as well be at her funeral. But guess what? She wakes up the next, you know, she wakes up the next morning. And what sleep is, actually, is a picture of death and resurrection. Let me tell you what God, the reason why God allowed sleep in humanity, it's a picture. Because somebody is asleep. And then they wake up. It's a picture of death and resurrection. That's God didn't have to have Adam fall asleep. Okay, He could have made man like him and just not need sleep. The Lord needs neither sleep or slumbers. But when he made this creature in his image and likeness, in his wisdom, he allowed man to sleep, the body to sleep. By the way, when you're asleep, your conscience still going. My, my daughter had the craziest dreams. And they seem real. You know what about dreams. So what that is a picture of is death and resurrection. Okay? And although she looks like she's dead in the casket, something, she wakes up the next day, so it's, hey, she's awake. But her body, when you're dead, the, from the body's point of view, that's what a sleep is. Your souls are with the Lord. Or if you're lost, your soul's down there in hell, waiting for the, or be resurrected at the great white throne, get your day in the court there, and thrown in the lake of fire. You and I will be there to help the Lord in that. So look at verse 13. But I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep. That ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. Now Paul is not saying we don't sorrow. If any of you, dear precious saints, went to be with the Lord before the rapture, it will be a sorrowful. Um, I did a study. I, I, do, I do funerals. And I remember a dear woman, Shelby. She's the woman I told you she used to be a white supremacist back in the day. So she says, if Ron, she used to joke, said, Ron, if you'd have told me, like I, I was in my late 20s. She was in her late 70s. And she said, if you would have told me way back in my white supremacy day, before I was even born, that I would have had a young black man teaching me God's word, she says, I would have laughed, laughed, laughed. Now she didn't even want to leave my presence. This she did, she would just hug me. On her deathbed, she, I went to the on her deathbed, she says, Ron, I called the chaplain up, so when you get here, talk to him about the record. <laughs> she was on her deathbed. She ended up dying, going to be with the Lord. I did her funeral, Shelby. And then I did a study the next day, it's called Her Empty Seat. Because when Jonathan and David, they were so close, and they would sit together in Saul's court there, Jonathan being the son of, of Saul, and David was his friend. He was Saul's uh, minister, you know, music minister, and then he became king. And when Saul was after David, David wasn't there. His seat was empty. And, and that's what it said about Jonathan. He just would look at David's empty seat. He missed his friend. And that's how it was. Shelby would just, she would plop right up front there, right there. She'd come with her cane and stuff, and she'd just get right up front. And the next day, after her funeral, there, she wasn't there. And so we did miss her. And, but, but notice that ye sorrow not. We don't sorrow like the, the world does, 2 Corinthians. You sorrow not 
even as others which have no what? No hope. See, the lost man knows that there's a God. They, 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 they have a fear of the unknown. Why fear death? Because they have a fear of the unknown, but they know there's something on the other side. They can deny it. They can pretend like it doesn't. But why, why is it when somebody gets hurt in an accident, they're on their deathbed, their whole family, oh, we want you to get healed. But after they die, well, they're in a better place. That's just something they say to comfort themselves. They really fear death. You and I, I mean, it's natural fear death in our, in our humanity, but we don't really have to fear death because to depart and be with Christ is what? Far better, right, Paul says. Far better. In fact, Philippians 1, Paul's thinking, he says, I could depart and be with Christ, which is far better, or I could stay here in the flesh, more needful for you. With the mind of Christ, he was thinking, you know, I'll stay here and I know the Lord will allow, will, will sanctify that, that, that or, or, or how do I say it? He will allow that decision. <clears throat> he will confirm that decision and I'll stay because it's more needful for you. Paul understood ministry. He says, I could just go, read Philippians 1, but I'll stay here for your sakes, okay? So we don't fear that. Paul didn't fear death. He saw it as a departure to be with Christ. But I want you to see that we're not to sorrow. Those lost people have no hope of resurrection into God's kingdom. There's no place in God's kingdom. They don't have the same hope Hope of glory, but hope in the resurrection to glory that we have. And I know one day I'll see Shelby when we have that reunite, re or reunion of the body of Christ. She's probably sitting at the gate waiting. <laughs> Knowing Shelby, she would. She probably says, come on, Lord, hurry up. Let's go. That's Shelby. She's a business lady. She got a little spunk. Well, let me tell you here. It says in verse 14, for if we believe. Now, this is for a believer. Paul is using the fact that he does with the Corinthians, the gospel. He says to Corinthians, you guys say it's no resurrection, some of you. But do, don't you know the gospel? How did Christ die for our sins, was buried and rose again? If we believe that Jesus did what? Died and rose again. I mean, isn't that our gospel? The good news is that Christ died for our sins. He, God made his soul an offering for sin. And then he didn't stay in the grave, but he was raised again for our justification, Romans 4.25. So if we believe that, do we believe that? Sure. Even so, the same thing that happened to our Lord Jesus Christ will happen to these believers. Even so, them also which sleep in Jesus, Paul in the Bible, when it comes to righteous people, saints, they use the term sleep mostly to describe their physical death. Because this is not... It's, death means separation. The only thing you're separated from in your physical death as a believer is from the other saints in your body because you're present with the Lord. Notice what it says in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, even so, the same thing, them also which sleep in Jesus, look at their position, that's a positional truth. They're in Christ. Shall God bring with them? Right there, you have a declaration of the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. Bring with them. Bring with them where? Verse 15. For this we say unto you. This is Paul, Timotheus, and, 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 and Silvanus. They taught this information. Later we're going to see that there were some men who were teaching this information about the rapture, but because they would not listen to Paul, because you know our denominational brethren, and some do teach about the rapture and talk about it, but they mix it up. And I'm going to show you how they mix it up. Timothy didn't. Sylvanus Silas didn't. But there are people who talk about the rapture and they mix it up. That's why I want this on record so that you can have something to share with others. Verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. What we're going to see is that this issue of the rapture is something that is unique and distinct to the Apostle Paul. It's not mentioned in any other of the scriptures outside of Paul. It's a mystery. It's a mystery. We're going to see that. That's right. That we which are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord. Now, before I break out on all that, let me show you something about that word rapture. Because this is going to come up. Okay? Is the word trinity in the scripture? No. No. But it's the concept of trinity. The principle of a trinity, which is one God and three persons. Is that in the scripture? You bet, all through scripture. The I'll God, give you one. The Godhead, right? the Godhead. I'll give you one right now. It's actually the Godhead. Matthew chapter 28, 
Jesus tells his apostles to go into all the world and preach the gospel, baptizing them in the name of the what? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And that's all through that. So there you go. 1 John 5, 7. 1 John 5, 7. Um, there are three to bear witness. The, 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 what is it? The Father, Father the, the Word, Word, and the Holy Spirit. Host, and and, and the, these three are one. Yeah, and, these three are one. and we have many other verses, even in the Old Testament. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Word became flesh. Uh, the Messiah says, Isaiah 61, quoting Luke 4, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for the Lord has anointed me, and you got the Messiah. It's all through there. So although the word Trinity, the concept of the Godhead, and that's what it's called there, is in there. Same for the rapture. And I'm going to show you the rapture. What we're going to see is that the rapture is actually, and, and, and what it references, it's, it's called the resurrection. Okay. Now the problem is, there are more than one resurrection in Scripture. The resurrection for the body of Christ, known as the rapture, and I'll tell you where that word came from. That's a separate resurrection from the Daniel, okay, John 5, Daniel 12, Revelation 21. There's all these, let me make sure it's Revelation 21, Revelation 20. Yes. Revelation 20. So Daniel 12, you can, you can check on your own time. Daniel 12. John 5, the Lord talks about it, John 5, and Revelation 20, all talk about the resurrections. But they're prophetic resurrections for the nation of Israel and so forth. There's the, the first resurrection and the second, okay? Called the one for the just and the unjust. Think of Daniel 12, it's called, They which have done good to everlasting uh, glory and righteousness, and they have done uh, evil to everlasting contempt. But in prophecy, there's a resurrection that happens... For the Old Testament saying in, 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 the, in the nation of Israel at the return of Jesus Christ to the earth in prophecy. The day of atonement, right. The day of atonement for the nation of Israel. Then there's a thousand year first installment of his eternal kingdom where Satan is in the bottomless pit. He's dealing with the Gentiles under the law. Israel has their new covenant fulfilled. Then there's a second resurrection of the unjust, okay? That's different from the resurrection Paul's going to talk about. Go with me if you will. To 2 Timothy 2, very important passage here in 2 Timothy 2. So when it talk, comes to the rapture, understand that what the rapture is in reference to is the, re, the, the resurrection of the body of Christ. Here's what Paul says about it. There, there are guys who were teaching about this rapture and this resurrection, but because they didn't rightly divide it, they weren't listening to Paul, they were mixing it up, and I'm going to show you what happens when you mix it up. I'll, I'll show you a couple of verses people use today to mix it up in a minute, too. Look at 2, uh, 2 Timothy 2, 2 Timothy 2, verse number 16, well, look at verse 15. Study to show thyself approved unto God, in view of the judgment seat. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, oh, this is judgment seat, yeah. rightly what? Dividing the word of truth. All of God's word is true, but you have to rightly divide it. Mm -hmm. Prophecy from mystery, law from grace. Israel from the body, Moses from Paul, all these things. The, the heavenly program from the earthly program. What these guys, they talk, now watch what Paul says here. Verse 16, but shun and profane and vain babblings. These are things that aren't according to the godly, godliness message of the Apostle Paul. For they will increase unto more ungodliness. And their word, so there's going to be some folks speaking words. Their word would eat us not the canker. That canker or cancer just eats at the body, right? Well, there's doctrinal leaven as well, error, that will just eat up the body of Christ and destroy it. Well, notice the Galatians were dealing with that. They were, they were allowing the law principles to eat up the body of Christ. Watch this. He, he says, he says <coughs> if you bite and devour one another. Watch this. Verse number 17. He, he mentions two men in each of these chapters of, first, of 2 Timothy. All four chapters he mentions a couple of men. Here he mentions Hymenus and Philetus. These were two preachers. They're saved men. Of whom is Hymenus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. So there was a truth that they were talking about, and that truth was the resurrection of the body of Christ. Who concerning the truth have what? Erred by saying, their word, that the resurrection is what? Has, Has already, and when you, when you say stuff like that, you do what? You overthrow the faith of some, not all. Because some people are going to hear you talking about it and be like, 
That's not how Paul teaches that. But many, that's why I'm doing this message, aren't sure or haven't been taught. And it overthrows the faith of some. Because what they did is they spoke about the resurrection of the body of Christ, commonly called the rapture today. But they didn't rightly divide it. They, they didn't put it in its proper context dispensationally. Mm, dispensational error. Dispensational error. And that's the main error of denominationalism and religion. Where did they got that from? They just didn't listen to Paul. Their pride. Pride will do that. Okay, so here's what we're going to see about the issue of the resurrection, commonly called the rapture. We're about to see that. That it's, that it's a mystery, only revealed to Paul. We'll see that. That it is pre-tribulation. See, they were mixing it. I, I, I guarantee you, they, they got it wrong, and they were putting it where it shouldn't have been in the wrath of God, the pre, what happens after the actual resurrection of the body of Christ. Pre-tribulation. They still do. They still do. Pre-wrath. Just so you'll know, pre-prophecy. What I mean by that is, before God starts his prophetic clock again with Israel. All of this. Well, he came up with it before he even started it in the first place. Exactly. This is all part of the mystery, right? That God came up with before he did anything. Yep. And in that mystery of Christ given to Paul, this issue of the resurrection of the body of Christ, the thing that ends the dispensation of grace, the fullness of the Gentiles become in... That's the issue. Now, where did this word rapture come from? Let me show you something about that. The, the word rapture is not in the Bible, but the, but the concept is, just like Trinity. Now, where did that rapture come from? Well, when you look at, go, go, back, to, you first, go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Good, we're making a good time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to show you where it came from. We read the passage in the beginning. This issue of the rapture, where does this come from? Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, if you will. <clears throat> Notice what it says. Then we which are alive and remain shall be... You see that word caught up? Yeah. All right. So many of you are familiar. Caught up. Now, I don't like going into Greek unless it you know, builds up God's word. Some people go to tear down God's word, say really it should be this, or to you know, show us smart day. No. <laughs> the Greek word for that, though has to do with a, a word, uh, harpazo, okay? I'm just letting you know just why I'm going there. Because there's the Greek word, but that's not the word that's, that's used. Harpazo, which, which means to take by force in Matthew 11, take by force, catch away. The Lord talks about the thief comes to take away that which, the, the enemy comes to take away that which was sold, take, catch away. Uh, John 10, they can't pluck you out of my hands. The Spirit of God caught away Philip in Acts 8, 39. The soldiers took Paul by force, took him by force in Acts 20. It means to take by force, to, to, car to carry off. But that's not the word. It's, it's a Latin word, okay? A Latin word, it's called rep. It's a different, different word, but rapturo. Rapturo, that's the most common way of saying it. That's a Latin word. It means to seize and carry off. To seize and carry off like this. Now, that doesn't, that's not the same as 2 Thessalonians. Sometimes people see Paul talks about the falling away. And they'll say, well, that's got to be the rapture. No, no, no. That's prophetic. He's talking about the falling away of Israel and Hebrews. To fall away, they fall this way. A rapture is to caught up, to seize and carry off upwards. Or, you know, pull away. Not fall, but like to seize and carry off, okay? And so it's the Latin part. So I, I, I said to myself, well, why would they then just start calling it rapture? Well, here's what I believe. It was kind of dicey, it's just Latin. Um, probably it's got some Roman Catholicism involved. Sure, it's, it's either out of the old Latin or the, the, old Latin, Latin, or the yeah. Latin Vulgate. Or the Latin Roman. Vulgate. Right. But I can see what, what, was, what was going on there. They're trying to make a distinction because Paul calls it the resurrection. Okay. But because there's more than one resurrection in Scripture, yeah. to distinguish this resurrection, the one for the body of Christ, that makes sense. from the others, the, the, the nation of Israel here, and uh, the lost of all the ages at the end of the kingdom, if you're going to say what resurrection, you've got to ask which resurrection. So it was just a convenience now to just say the rapture. Probably the same reason why they call the judgment seat of Christ the bema seat sometimes, right? Yeah. Similar. To well, that. good point. Right. You hear people use that Greek word bema seat, right? 
which I understand they're trying, uh, there you go, they're trying, uh, I hope they're trying to distinguish it between the other judgments, the judgment of Israel, the judgment of the nations, and so forth. So they'll say, Bema see, so you can know, oh, that's the one here, the one that the rapture is going to take us to. Mm -hmm. Someone asked me what, where, the, where it was found in Scripture, the Bema. Well, it's the, it's the Greek word behind I know, judgment. But I didn't have an answer at that point. By the way, Bema seat's mentioned ten times in your King James Bible. Mm -hmm. Ten is associated with that judgment. Okay. All right, let's keep going. So that's so for, for, for convenience sake, the rapture is used, that Latin word, rapture, to distinguish the resurrection of the body of Christ from other resurrections. At least that's how I'm going to use it, okay? Now, let's look at some other things about the rapture. The issue of the rapture, it's, I'm going to tell you what it is and what it's not, okay? we got a half an hour, so here, just, just stick with me. It's known as the resurrection, that's what it's called, of the body of Christ, 2 Timothy 2.18, we saw that. It's to distinguish from the Daniel 12, John 5, Revelation 20, raptures, excuse me, uh, uh, resurrections that, uh, uh, for the uh, prophetic program, the, that of Israel at their return in Old Testament saints, and then that of the, of the unjust, just and unjust. It was a mystery given to Paul alone. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. Hold your place in 1 Thessalonians. We're going to be going back because both of these go together. 1 Thessalonians, excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And, and look at verse 50. Usually I start at 51, but I was like, look at verse 50. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 50. Watch this. Now, now this I say. Now when Paul says that, he's saying, I'm giving you some apostolic. Uh, in my apostolic authority, I'm giving you some truth that's unique. Now this I say, you remember the Lord would talk? He says, you've heard it's been said of them of old time. You heard Moses say, but I say unto you. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul is doing. He's saying, I'm giving, I'm going to tell you what this truth is. Focusing on the messenger. Focus on the messenger. My gospel. Follow me. All those things unique to Paul there. Here we go. Verse 50, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood can or cannot, cannot, cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit corrupt, incorruption. But wait a minute. Paul says that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But did you know that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back at the second coming, it's going to be all type of flesh and blood in that kingdom. Some of the Jews, the ones who aren't resurrected, they just kind of go in there. They're going to have children. They're going to multiply. Seed of Abraham forever. The, all the Gentile nations that survive the, 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 this time out here, it's not going to really affect California and the United States. It's in the Middle East. But you understand, there are going to be all type of flesh and blood there. The sheep and goat judgment of Matthew 25, 31 on down. He's going to say, going to gather everybody, come and come be blessed of my Father. So what does Paul mean in verse 50 that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God? No, they're going to inherit. Read Matthew 25. It says, come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom from the foundation of earth. Okay? No. Obviously, he's not talking about the kingdom of God down here on the earth. Paul is talking unique to the kingdom of God where? Yeah. The heavenly kingdom. Because think about this. The one of the things that's going to happen at the rapture is we're going to get new bodies. Flesh and bones. Dorothy, I'll throw this at you. No, no, that's good. You're right on. When I say that, that's a good, that's a good term. I'm not throwing as an eagle. That's a loose concept that you've taught. It's not the Iraqi throwing a shoe at the president. <laughs> this means, girl, that's what I'm talking about. Yes. The Lord Jesus Christ's body, what did he tell his disciples? His apostles. A spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have, right? The Lord, in his resurrection body, he no longer needed the blood because the life of the human flesh today is in the what? Blood. But do you need blood? You don't need blood to be in the heavenly places. No. So his resurrection body, he had that blood so he could shed his blood. But in his, in his new resurrection body, he's flesh and bone. He tells Tommy. Looks like this, but it's flesh and bone. It's like a new species of human. It's a new species of human. A new, uh, yeah, it's a new body. Celestial. Yeah, so it's a body, body celestial. So that's what Paul is talking about. This is the type of body. Philippians 3, Paul says, For our conversation is in heaven, verse 19 through 21, uh, 1, right? 
From whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall what? Change our vile bodies that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Mm -hmm. Ephesians 5, we're bone of his bone, flesh of his flesh. So when Paul says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, the heavenly kingdom, that's what he's talking about in context. We're going to have flesh and bone. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. All right. But look at verse 51. Behold. So he's going to, he said, look, I love that. Behold, Shh, look at this. Okay, Paul, what do you want to see? I, I show you a what? Mystery. Mystery. This is unique to Paul. This was a secret that God had in mind, but now revealed. We shall not all, what? Sleep. Remember he says, then which also sleep in Jesus, but there's a group of members of the body of Christ who will not taste physical death. Mm -hmm. Could be our, amen, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. changed. We're all going to have that glorious body made like unto his body. That's Paul, a miracle. I, it, it is a miracle. Yes. Well, well, Philippians 3 says, he says, no, no, just stay right there. I'm just going to read it. Because the way he says it here is pretty not. Verse 21, uh, Philippians 3. Who shall change our vile bodies, change, that it may be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Dorothy meant a miracle. According to or in line with the working whereby he is able even to subdue all things to himself, Dorothy. Talking about the power that the Lord Jesus Christ has over the creation. Particularly that, that all things unto himself subdue. What he's saying in there is also the bodies that we will have will have the, I, I, I got to go through the detail when we get to 1 Corinthians 3. After the judgment seat of Christ, each of our bodies will be, will bear glory based upon what we've, what we've earned at the, the issue of being the joint heir, but what we've earned in faithfulness down here. Just like in military, you can look at, you can see five men with military uniforms, and if you knew military uniforms, you could say, his authority, oh, he's just a private. That's a four-star general. You know, he's an officer. Our bodies will bear that type of glory because joint heirs will reign with Christ. All the rest of the heirs of God will be in his heavenly kingdom. Mm -hmm. One lady says, I wouldn't mind, you know, cleaning up after the horses in the stable. <laughs> I said, but if you believe in this stuff, you want me doing that, you're going to be in a rulership position as a joint heir. Right. Now that position has to be done. So those who were in Christ and they they weren't faithful to the mystery now, the Lord will determine where they do. And maybe there are going to be some who have that. They'll be in the kingdom, but they have the, every name that is named. Ephesians one. All right. And so that's a, in the military analogy, yours it's like the gold, silver, and precious stones are like the medals and stuff. The medals and, then and the things? position of reigning uh, is the is the rank. I got I got a whole list of that. I, for our flip, for our for our, uh, First Corinthians three study, I was crazy enough to think that I would get all get to all that the last time. Anyway, yeah, I broke all that down, so it should be an interesting study. That subdue is also subduing the powers, principalities, thrones, dominions, mights, all that stuff too. Yeah, and it's in the context of the Ephesians one. He's going to use members of the body of Christ, mm -hmm. particularly. That's what that's one of the reasons why we we need those types of bodies to. To do those positions as well. Yeah. The Lord Jesus Christ needed that new body, still has the Prince of Calvary and so forth, because as he sits as head of the heaven and earth, on earth, the, the head planet in God's overall creation is earth. So Jesus Christ himself was sit. The command but center. The command center. But he has all other types of plans and things that Jesus Christ rules and reigns over. But if he physically down here, which he is, he's, he's in a physical body, one body with the whole. He's going to be down here on the earth. He was promised to Abraham's seed. So how will Jesus Christ rule over his entire creation? Would he like the angels? No. Are, would be, they, are they different are, than our new bodies? Yes. Mm -hmm. Angels don't have flesh. Or both. Mm -hmm. Angels are spirit beings. Spirit. Great question. Angels are spirit beings who make his angels, uh, uh, his ministers, a uh, spirit and angels flame of fire. But the spirit Hebrews. doesn't have a body. No, spirits do have body. Spiritual body. Kind. Spiritual body. We got to deal with that in the QA. and I got to keep going. <laughs> great question. No, that's a great question. No, no, no. Angels look like men in the scripture. That's right. They just have a different type of body. Okay. Mankind has a fleshly, earthy body. 1 Corinthians 15. Read 1 Corinthians 15 tonight. The angels have a body that looks like ours. When men see angels, what did we learn in Hebrews? Hebrews, they, Hebrews says to the, to the reader, he says, 
be, be aware to entertain angels. Unaware. For some have entertained, oh, excuse me. Some be, entertaining just unaware. Yeah, I'm sorry. Be, be, be uh, I got all these verses in my head, trying to rush this time. Uh, entertain strangers, for some have entertained angels unaware. Because they didn't know, they just looked like men. But really, angels are, who make his ministers, uh, spirits and flames of fire. They're a different body. We'll talk about that, okay? okay yeah. Mankind has a body of dust. Not even dirt, but dust. Joel calls it dust and ashes. We're made of dust. But our new body is a, is a new glorified, it's, it's what Ryan said, it's a new species. I, I can't explain it. It's just, it looks like the old stuff. It's flesh and it's bone, but that's it. But it's glorified. It can walk through walls. It can just go and appear in all types of stuff. Well, that's what I thought the angels yeah. could do. They can with their body, but it's a different body. We'll go over there. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. No, no, no problem. All right. Good. Y'all still got, got 17 minutes. All right. Here we go. So look at 1 Corinthians 15, verse 51. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be what? Changed. Changed into our vile bodies to his glorious body, flesh and bone. Now keep going. Verse 52. In a moment... And he describes that moment in the twinkling of an eye. It is said that a twinkling of an eye is not even a blink. It's the time of how, how light flashes off of your, your pupil. How fa it's just, and it, it's, it was faster than that. He's, he's slowing down for us the process of what's going to take place at the rapture. Before we know it, we could be talking right now. We don't know. <laughs> oh, I wish. I told the Lord just time it so as I'm talking about this. <laughs> <laughs> in a twinkling of eye, the time it takes the light to to uh, bounce off your eye. Hold up, we still got to get the video out to YouTube. <laughs> we ain't worried about them if the rapture happens. I stay on their own, man. <laughs> They'll have it, Ryan, because when they come in here, they're like, "What's this?" You know, somebody appeared. No, we we don't worry about nobody after the rapture. Man. Get, no, we love people. Ryan and I are gonna get a if if if, if we're not here. If you if you were left behind, we're gonna give them. A, we got a grace. God's grace. We're gonna, gonna tell them what to do. Behind. I'm not going to be left behind. Not you. <laughs> Dorothy, you're saved. You're in Christ. I, we're, Ryan and I said that for the, for, to be gracious to people, we may just record a nice little half hour video what to do if you miss the rapture. Because I can tell them Actually, what to do out here. Yeah. Yeah. That's a graciousness. We don't have to do well, it. There's already a video it. called uh, Rightly Dividing the Rapture that kind of answers that on our YouTube yeah. channel. So yeah. Yeah. Do not open until the rapture. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, no. Everybody here, and most people listen to me, I guess this is somebody yeah. new. If you know for sure you have eternal life through the blood of Christ, you're going to be at this rapture. The okay, resurrection. Amen. All right, so verse 52. In a moment, it's twinkling an eye. Now, by the way, at the last trump. Now, some other versions and then people, when they read that, even amongst dispensationalists, which is weird, they read it, they will read the, the word as trumpet, mm -hmm. right. which is the craziest thing, because what does that say? Trump. At the last trump. trump. And just so you know that Paul knows the difference between a trump and a trumpet, look at the next one. For the what? Trumpet shall sound. So in one verse, Paul uses two terms. He knows what he means. He says the last trump, okay, for the trumpet shall sound. So Paul's not confused between a trump and a trumpet. People are. Hold your hand here, and let me show you something from, uh, go back to 1 Thessalonians 4. I'm going to explain what this issue of the trump and the trumpet. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to go down to verse 15, 16, 17, and so forth. Stick with me about this trump. By the way, let me say this in case we get cut off if we got 15 minutes. It has nothing to do with the trumpets in Revelation chapter number, what was my Revelation uh, verse at? The ones in Revelation. It's nothing to do with the, the trumpets in Revelation 8, okay? okay. Got to write it by that. Those are trumpets that are synonymous or connected to the seven years. The seven trumpets are connected to the seven years of the tribulation period, okay? Each year of the tribulation period, you know, something's going to happen on the Feast of Trumpets, I believe, because he blows his trumpet. So it's going to begin, the, 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 it's going to begin the, the tribulation, and each year this angel will sound, the first angel will sound his trumpet, the second. It is all associated with prophecy, the wrath of God, okay? All right? So these, this trumpet, trumpet and this trump is associated with the mystery. Let's look at it. 1 Thessalonians 4, verse number 16. Well, let me go down to verse 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord. The Lord Jesus Christ gave Paul this information. 
Sometimes he gave Paul specific information. Sometimes he didn't. First Corinthians, they asked him questions that the Lord didn't directly reveal to Paul, but he used the mind of Christ his understanding from the word of God's grace to give them, and he'll say, this I command, not the Lord, but his scripture. He'll say, the Lord really didn't tell me this, but I give you one as one who is, who is uh, worthy, is the faithful in the Lord, who's uh, worthy. It's scripture, okay? Yeah. Paul gives his Did opinion. The Holy Spirit ratified in his scripture. Exactly. So, but this one, th what he's about to say, the Lord told him this, that, verse 15, that we which are alive and remain... Unto the what? Coming of the Lord. So the rapture is the coming of the Lord. He's going to come out of heaven. Whoa, right here. Shall not prevent. That word prevent. That's, that's that old English word that has to do with, um, how do I want to say? It, it, it means to come before or precede. Yeah, Pre-event. Pre-event, yeah. To, to come before. That same Greek word is used in the Bible, in the scripture, as to come or to attain. We won't come before or attain something before the, the, those who are dead. He's saying we shall not, like, like Ryan said, to pre-event, pre to proceed or come before. This is going to be something that's going to happen, but the, the people who die first, technically they're going to be involved first. Well, watch this, watch this. we got to go back to 1 Corinthians because their bodies and then our bodies. Okay, here, keep going, here we go. Shall not prevent or go before them which are asleep, those who have already died. Four, further explanation, verse 16. For the Lord himself, personal attention, doesn't send an angel. He said he comes. The Lord Jesus Christ gets off his throne in the heavens, the third heaven, and comes down for his body. With an with a, with a escort of an, an angels, by the way. Okay, here we go. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. Can't even go into all that. The shout is the shout of a conquering king. The shout of war. Uh, this rapture is a declaration of war to the earth. Take the ambassadors out of the country. Right? Taking the ambassadors out, like any good, good. Uh, when you, when one country declares war on another, if they have ambassadors there, they recall their ambassadors first. Then they put a declaration of war. God has been holding back His wrath and war, judgment, make war, Revelation nineteen eleven, for a couple thousand years. But one day He's going to end that, and He's going to declare war on the world that declared war on Him. The world declare war on God, Acts 4. Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine? Psalm 2. I'm just going through this fast, sorry. But the world was at war with God. Instead of pouring out his wrath when Christ came down, Christ came down, saved the chief of sinners, poured out his grace and peace, right? Declaration of grace and peace, mercy. But when God ends this, that shout is a shout of proclamation of war. For us to come home. Yeah. Well, it's a lot of things. Us coming home, but it's also for the world to say, hey, it comes to wrath. All right? Verse 16. With the voice of the archangel. Now, the only archangel actually mentioned in Scripture is Michael. You can make a case for Gabriel. And there's other archangels mentioned in other spurious type of stuff. This most likely there. I believe there are the seven spirits of, 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 of Almighty God in Revelation who stand before the Lord. Okay? But the fact is, the one who I think this one is, although he's not named, is the one who is the captain of the Lord's host in heaven, and that is Michael. When warfare is done, Revelation 12, Michael, his angels fight against the dragon, his angels. So I believe Michael, and then God, what our Lord is doing is getting a military escort through the heavenly places down to the earth. Interesting enough, we believe that Ryan and I were talking, just speculating, that's all it is, and that that when, when, when Christ came, he met Paul at noon there on the road to Damascus in the Middle East. Brighter than the noonday sun. Brighter, brighter than the noonday yeah. sun, that light. So that will probably be the same place that we all go up. Where it began is where it probably ends. Interesting enough, there's going to be some clock. Well, let's look at this. I, I got a little theory on this, too. You can take it over. But the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with the shout. With the voice of the archangel, which I believe was Michael and his angels, and with the trump of God. Notice that's the trump of God, right? Not trumpet, trump. Mm -hmm. All right, good in Jerusalem is two in the morning here too. Oh yeah, that's right. So it's gonna be a night. Ryan will still be up. I'm gonna be in the bed. <laughs> He's a night owl, I'm a morning bird. Make sure you give me. If you're extended to about six or five in the morning, Lord, then uh, yeah. All right. So here he says the trump of God. So just let me get this on here. Trump of God. 
So this trump is the trump of God. It's going to be a sound that God himself makes. So that's going to be the Lord Jesus. Over in 1 Corinthians, he says, so look at 1 Corinthians. Look at 1 Corinthians. 15 again. Verse 52. So it had nothing to do with the Revelation 8's last trump, the seventh trump, none of that. There's two trumps. One trump and two trumps. Verse 52. In a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the what trump? Amen. Last trump. So that you know what a trump is, for the trumpet shall what? Sound. sound. So what a trump is, it's the sounding of a trumpet. A trumpet trumps. Yeah, a trumpet trump. We had a brother in the Lord. He was a trumpeter for the, is that the right word, trumpeter? He played the trumpet for the University of Minnesota in college. So when he read that, he, he was like, oh yeah, that's where it is. That's exactly what we do. He was a trumpet player. He says, when you blow in a trump, that sound is called the trump. So there's a trump of God, and then there's a last trump. Now, if there's a last trump, it's okay and reasonable to assume that there's a first trump. So without going through a lot of detail, because I did this thing, when in Israel, when the trumpet sounded for battle, or when, when God moved the Israelites through the wilderness, he had them blow the trumpet twice. One was to gather, and the other was to move, okay? Then they moved the tabernacle and so forth. They're moving in their wonderings. And so what's going to happen is, notice here in chapter number 15, verse 52, In a moment it took them by the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised, what? Incorruptible. So at the first trump, the dead in Christ, over in 1 Thessalonians 4, shall rise, what? First. Everybody got that? Yep. So the first blowing of that trumpet, the dead, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, or 1 Thessalonians, Paul says, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Over in 1 Thessalonians, he says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. Mm -hmm. So the dead comes first, and then those who are alive, if it happens right now, that'd be us, we come second, okay? The dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. All right, T together, oh, let's finish reading this. Sorry about that. My time. Verse number 52. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be what? Changed. Four, verse 53. <coughs> This corruptible, that's that dead body in the grave of that saint, like Shelby. We, 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 we buried her. Or did we have a, did she have a cremator? She went one. to a cremator, sorry. This she didn't want to waste no money. She's like, it's just my dust. Anyway, so her little urn gone up. Not the urn, but the, her, her <laughs> dust. Her dust. Because this corruptible must put on incorruption. Must. Verse 53. And this mortal, now what the word mortal means? Subject to death, right? Mm -hmm. That's you and me. We're mortals. Mm -hmm. We're subject to death. We must put on immortality. When we get our new body of flesh and bone, we won't die. Verse 54. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, those are the dead bodies of the saints who already passed, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, that's us when the rapture happens if we're alive, mm -hmm. then shall be brought to pass the same, that is written, death is swallowed up in what? Victory. That's when we'll have the victory over death. Until then, death is the ultimate dis-ease. You know what a disease is? It disses your ease. That's what it does. <laughs> man, why are you dissing me, man? That's what sin and death does. It disses your ease. You sitting at ease, and sin and death just mess everything up takes loved ones, just it mess everything up. One day, no more of those diseases, even the worst disease, death. Okay? Amen? Maybe that day will be today. Death is swallowed up. Oh, when I talk about, oh boy, when I talk about Jonah, somebody asked about the three days, three nights, so I have to do that one. Maybe I'll just do a study at home and send it around and put up, because the Jonah swallowed up and stuff. What the well represents is, is, is death in Scripture. It's always there, hardly seen. God mentions it in Genesis 1, the only animal he mentions by name, the whale. 11 after 7, something like that. Oh, no, just with the whale, the size of his mouth and so forth. A whale represents death, how it's just there. Hardly see it, but it, it exists. 
and it swallowed up Sean. I, I get all of that when I do the three days, three nights in the well's belly. Anyway, let's keep going. I got to end. All right. I'm just saying, God created a well to show the death. How it just swallows up. What's going to happen at the rapture is death is going to be swallowed up. Now, Ryan was telling us how big a well. A well's tongue wouldn't fit in this. It's bigger room. than an elephant. Huh? Yeah. Blue, yeah blue, so, blue. so what I'm saying is, maybe I got to do that one day. I'll tell you why, why I believe God created a well. The biggest animal on the earth. It's the, it's the most dominating animal, although it's not seen. It's in the cover of only the waters. But it's the most massive thing. It represents death. Biggest How animal that's, that's ever been on the earth. Oh, yeah, ever. Yeah. And, and when, when it comes to man, the thing that has messed up man from the beginning is death. And that's what the well represents. But what victory in Christ does, it swallows up even that. In the end, by the way, death and hell will be what? Thrown in a lake of fire. Mm -hmm. All right. We got to end. So let's, let's do this real quick. Um, go back to 1 Thessalonians. I will give you some verses. I'm going to sum up some verses that people use to confuse the rapture. I'll just go real quick after I finish this. So go back to 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. See that? So at the first sounding of that trumpet, the dead, the incorruptible, will rise. Their bodies. Their physical bodies will. Their bodies will. All right? Physical bodily resurrection, 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 17 of 1 Thessalonians 4. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up. There's the rapture. Mm -hmm. Caught up together with them in the what? Cloud. Mm -hmm. Now notice it says caught up together with them. As their bodies go, you know, their bodies go up, then our bodies go up. We're going to, in the clouds. Now, he could just mean, you know, the clouds right there. But clouds in the Bible represent angels. Do you know there are going to be some angels there? Michael's there with his angels. It says when Jesus Christ ascended to the heaven, mm -hmm. he went up with the clouds of heaven, right? Mm -hmm. Or in Daniel says the clouds of heaven, the angels brought him to the ancient of days. He took it up. He took him to get his kingdom. Mm -hmm. um, I think the clouds there has to do with the heavenly angels. I'll give you some verses. The Lord says to the, to the, to the people there, he says, you shall see the Son of Man come with the clouds of heaven and all that. Yeah. He's not just talking about the, he's talking about the angels. The, then he'll say with my mighty angels. So I think these clouds have to do with the angelic. Here's my theory. <laughs> that just like the day Christ came and began this thing, it was something, event, some solar event that was brighter than the noonday sun. My speculation is that when that thing ends, an omen of, an omen of wrath for the earth, it wouldn't surprise me if the, if the NASA scientists see some type of super solar eclipse. Something that happens in the Middle East in the middle of, of the day, not bright because the beginning of this thing, but the end of it, and it just blocks out the sun. And what I think it'll be us, the body of Christ. It'll just be this cloud of angels and, and saints, and that thing is going to do something in the heavens and just, right in the Middle East, just block out the sun. A nice soul eclipse they wouldn't even explain. I wonder what the people on the earth will think. Well, the same thing they think when they see anything. They got some type of scientific thing for it. God has done that all through. He stopped time. Joshua said, sun, you stay still. Moon, you hold off. Mm -hmm. It held off. He turned back the sun to breeze for Hezekiah. God, mm -hmm. when, when Paul had, oh, when the Lord, and my thing on three days, he was on that cross, and in, in, the, in, the, in the middle of the day at noon, solar. it was dark, which is solar eclipse, dark for three hours. Mm -hmm. No doubt in my mind. It's just me. That's going to happen there. Those clouds. Because what does clouds do? They can block the sun, right? Clouds, you're going to have some angels, you're going to have some saints, and it's going to probably be right in the middle of the day there in the Middle East, and they're not going to be explaining how that solar eclipse happened. Just like, boom, like what happened? So they're not going to see people going out of the graves, and they're not going to mm -hmm. see that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They, here are these people, the unredeemed eyes and ears, they heard something, they saw the light, but they did not, they didn't hear the words and stuff. I mean, you know what? No, they may. I don't think they're going to actually see. Well, it's a twinkling of eye. It'd be so fast. That is so fast. That's right. Good answer. That's, it's going to be so fast. But what I think they will see is they're going to see the, the eclipse of the, the right. Lord and the clouds, the heavens, the heavens, the clouds of heaven with the angels, and then with the body all meeting there, probably right over in the Middle East where, where it began in Damascus, there, probably about 2 o'clock our time locally. So y'all stay up. <laughs> Everybody don't go to sleep until 201 every day. <laughs> All right? Is that, is that me? I, I can't stay up there. Is that why I wake up at 2 o'clock every morning? <laughs> <laughs> wow. 
wake down to sleep. So I think it might be some type of solar eclipse right over there in the middle of the day. But anyway, so we have to end. Let me give you these things for your own uh, perusal. Matt, Matthew 24, 36 through 41, and Luke 17, 26 through 37 are commonly used as the rapture by those who don't rightly divide. It's the one that says when one is taken and another is left, two men are a, a million, a, you know, a grinding at the mill, two women are grinding, Everybody one should be taken. The rapture? No, 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 but these are verses used. Oh. In the context of Matthew 24 and Luke 17, that's about judgment. Mm -hmm. Because they asked him, they say, Lord, where? He says, where the bodies or where the carcasses are, so shall the eager eagles be gathered also. Matthew 24, 27 through 29. He even uses that as a reference in my King James. Yes. Mm -hmm. And it's a reference to Job 39. It says the eagle, God made the eagle. She looks down upon the, 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 the prey. Where the slain are, so will the eagles be. Isaiah 56, 9, Jeremiah 12, 9, Ezekiel 39 talks about God's going to make a feast for the birds. Yeah. Brother Leonard was saying that there's the scientists are noticing that all these birds of prey seem to be making their way over into the Middle East in, in, in droves. Mm -hmm. And they're just, it's, it's kind of unusual. Maybe it's preparing. Stage being set for that day. Mm -hmm. Laying more eggs, too. Revelation 19 and Ezekiel 39 both talk that God calls the birds of, of, of the fowls of the air and say, feast, because he's going to have bodies and carcasses of uh, the, the, the battle of Armageddon there. And people use these scriptures to say the, 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 Matthew, the Matthew 24 and Luke 17 to say that that's the rapture. Mm -hmm. Two will be men and one taken, the other left. That's what I and they, told well, them. that's how they, they got, but the one taken was to take into judgment. Yeah, just like uh, Luke talks about the flood that destroyed them all with Noah. Yeah. He's comparing that. I know. Flood destroyed them all in there. Mm -hmm. and he, he talks about it's as judging. the days of Noah, but he also talks about as the days of Lot. Mm -hmm. We focus on the days of Noah part, but he then says the days of Lot. What happened in Lot's day? Remember he said, remember Lot's wife? That was in context of the fire and brimstone. It was judgment. Mm -hmm. So these passages are not the rapture because they're not from in Paul's epistles. Right. They're really judgment. <laughs> all right, we have to end. Um, Paul says that he it's pre-tribulation, pre-wrath, pre-prophecy. -pre -pro Romans 5, 9, Paul says he delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 1, 9 and 10, who have delivered us from the wrath to come. 1 Thessalonians 5, 9, take unto you the helmet of salvation, for God has not appointed us to wrath. He's appointed Israel to wrath, the appointment, not the body, right? Amen. Baptism of fire for them, right? Baptism of fire for them. That's why he would even resurrect people in Israel's prayer. Why did, why did Christ just raise people from the dead? They have to go through that. They're appointed to rest. Yeah. Just like with Enoch, you guys don't mind, right? Just like with Enoch, pre-Abraham, Enoch, here comes the wrath, the flood. But Enoch is taken out. He's translated before the flood when his son Methuselah died, right? When, when Methuselah's name is when, when he dies, it shall come. That's what Methuselah means. Methuselah, who lived longer than any other man, 969 years, when he died, the flood came. Enoch was translated out before the, before the wrath, but Noah went through it, right? And pre-Abraham, Enoch represents, I think, the body of Christ. Just like Adam and Eve right. represent uh, the body of Christ, the Asian flood. And then Noah represents the little flock who go through the ark, go through the wrath, right? Mm -hmm. So you can tell God had all that in mind. My point is, the rapture is only mentioned in Paul. It, it is the thing that delivers us, his ambassadors, from the wrath to come, war. Ephesians 6 says, take unto you the, for a hope, a, for, for, for a, helmet, a hope of salvation, for God has not appointed us to wrath. So lastly, gosh, man, I hate this. the rapture is not just simply the end of this dispensation of grace, but it is the beginning or the commencement Amen. of a greater event called the judgment seat of Christ. It is the vehicle by which we will appear and stand before our, judgments, our Lord's judgment seat to give an account of our lives down here, whether we were faithful or not in the mystery. Fruit that abounded to our account, whether it's the work of faith, what we're doing now, whether we take what we learn and give it to, uh, out to others, the labor of love, your time, your talent, your treasures. And when, when you do those two, the policy of evil will try to get you to stop, to faint. That's the patience of hope through the suffering. But that's what we're going to be getting back at the judgment seat. He's going to show how faithful were the joint heirs. 
those who believe this message, there's, there's levels of faithfulness there. And even of the heirs of God, the people who haven't believed the grace of God, but some people who don't rightly divide, like Billy Graham, has used his life to serve the Lord in some small capacity with a clear gospel back in the 50s. Whereas in other members of the body of Christ have done nothing to serve the Lord. So even amongst heirs, there's mm -hmm. different levels, just like with joint heirs. Oh. You want to be a joint heir at the top, pressing toward the mark. Mm -hmm. My job is to help you do that. Get it into me and get it into you. And that's what we're doing here, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so the rapture is going to lead us to the judgment. Yes. Instantly. In fact, the, Paul, when Paul talks about the rapture, He's talking about it less for us delivered out of here more, but that's going to, it's, it's the, the thing that's taking us there, the destination. It's the kickoff. It's the, it's the kickoff. It's called, Paul calls it the day of the Lord Jesus. He calls it the day of Christ, except in 2 Thessalonians 2, he's talking about the day of Christ in prophecy. He calls it that day. He calls it his appearing. He calls it when the Lord shall appear. So you, you got it right, Laurel. What, the way Paul looks at the resurrection is just the vehicle to get to the actual judgment of Christ. Okay. We look at it just as, oh, get us out of here, Lord. The world is crazy, <laughs> which it is. Paul said, no, no, no. It's the thing that gets us to the judgment seat. Okay. you got to take that appearing in context, too, though. Well, Sometimes that's talking about the road to Damascus. And, yeah. When you say judgment seat, you're talking about rewards. Yep. Yeah. Or lack thereof. Or lack thereof. Yeah. yeah. Reward, or, uh, re reward or lack thereof. Uh, or looking for that blessed hope, Titus 2. And the glorious appearing is the motivation to live solely righteous and godly. You're to be looking for that constantly. Oh, and let me end with this. Here's the best definition of grace that I can see from Scripture all throughout Scripture. It's unmerited favor and undeserved kindness. But what grace is, it's freedom with responsibility. Okay? Did God create Adam, Adam and give him responsibility? You bet. Yeah. And accountability or consequences. Because even when God dealt graciously with Adam, he says, you can eat of all the trees of the garden, right? But of one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day, so Adam, I give you freedom to do whatever you want except one thing. Test his faithfulness. Because Adam's going to rule over the, the, the angelic. He has right. He has to show faithfulness to be God's region. And Adam, with that freedom, you can have it all. Just don't eat that one tree. And if you eat that one tree, what's going to happen? Thou shalt surely die. Accountability consequences. That's what grace is. And the grace of God today, God gives us freedom, but with responsibility to be faithful in this mystery. And the consequence comes out of the judgment seat of Christ. Were you faithful to this information? Yea, Lord. How faithful? Lord, to tell you. Were you not faithful? Mm -hmm. The Lord will tell you. Mm -hmm. Okay? My job is to make it that we all get our full reward. I want all of us to reign together. Let me end with this. One, one of our dear sisters says, she says, I can't be with you now. She lives on the other side of the, of the country in, in Georgia. She says, but I pray to God that in that day, when we reign in the heavenly places as joint heirs, that although I was far from you in distance, you know, 3,000 miles away, on the earth that we all minister together. I said, not only do I believe that we actually were discussing that. She didn't know we were discussing that. I think that's going to happen. That we all together, <coughs> labor together and ministry together. Now, we'll also do that together forever. Wouldn't that be just appropriate? All right. If you're listening tonight, you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today. Do you know for sure you spend eternity? I love you. These saints love you. More importantly, God loves you. God commended his love, Paul says, Romans 5, verse 8. And that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. You don't have to do any works by simple faith alone in the blood of Christ. God will save you this moment. Now that you're saved, your life is all about redeeming the time. There's not much time left. That rapture, and, and more important than the judgment seat of Christ, is, is, is soon to come. Like that woman in that email says, I don't want to die right now. Remember, a guy says, I, Ron, do you think that the Lord is soon to come? I'm ready to go home in the rapture. I said, you're not ready to go. You've only been in the grace message a few years, four or five years. You, that, no, you, you want to redeem the time. He says, you're right. Redeem that time. Redeem it. Because you want to get a full reward. I can help speed that up if you, you can save yourself and then that hear thee. That's what, that's what we're going to do at this ministry. All right, let's pray. Even though we get rejected for it sometime. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the truth of your word. We thank you for the rightly divided word of Christ. 
uh, in, in the Apostle Paul's epistles. We thank you for the blessed hope of the rapture and the judgment seat of Christ. For those of us who are faithful in the mystery, we know that there are going to be many who are ashamed, who uh, suffer loss, who are going to be saddened, who are going to be uh, shown uh, to be in error all the years that they wasted. But for those of us who seek to redeem the time, no matter how long we are uh, in this grace message and the mystery, we want to pray that we continue to grow, uh, doing the work of faith, growing in our love, abounding one toward another, the labor of love, the charity, the love of God. And also, Father, as we stand faithful to truths, we all are going to have times of suffering, rejection, even from those that we love. And um, it just happens, Father, to stand for the truth. But as long as we're willing and allow the word of God to strengthen our inner man, we can do it. And we can just press toward the mark. Because anytime something like this happens, Father, it's for your glory. May uh, all of us who stand faithful for these pinnacle doctrines of the apostle, although we suffer for them, may we um, stand fast, have others who stand fast with us through prayer and through being there for us with the, with the word. And we know that we're going to share in that glory at the judgment seat of Christ and forever and eternity. We thank you for all this in Christ's name. Amen.